out of it, like what I thought you wanted, but I don't know if it's right or not. Well, well I mean, I, I will take a look at that definitely. And uh, did you get a chance to look at the, the student model essay? Yes, sir, I did, but it was because like when I was like going back and forth between like the prompt and that essay, like mm -hmm. was that essay following like that same prompt? Because like I was like when trying to find like parts like from yeah, like, well, it's just essay yeah, it, and like nothing matched up. I don't know. Yeah, it, it's following the same prompt. It's just using a different story. Okay, well then I guess I did my essay wrong because I was like going through and like trying to find like to kind of try to follow that essay and I don't know it just yeah we'll look we, yeah we'll look at everything here momentarily yes sir all right so I'm gonna go ahead and get started I, I am recording this so for those that cannot uh, get here for whatever reason work school other commitments that's fine um, I will upload this before the end of the day in the week three folder so y'all can watch it back. Uh, basically, I hope everybody that's here or who will be watching this can see my little whiteboard here. Uh, basically, I have some web addresses. Uh, these are some of the sites that I sent out last week. So hopefully, if you've been checking your email, like I said, uh, it really pays off to, to especially with an online course, to check your Coastal Pines student email account uh, fairly regularly because I do send stuff out. Um, sometimes I upload it as well to the weekly folders, but instead of you know overcrowding Blackboard with a bunch of links, a lot of times I just um, I will send out emails with important links that will be helpful, uh, especially for not only that week's assignments, uh, but for you know future assignments. So these are some of the links. Hopefully, if you go back and check your email within the last seven days, eight days, whatever the case may be, um, you will still have these. I would, you know, definitely, you know, either bookmark them or save them somewhere so you can go back because uh, they won't necessarily be in your weekly Blackboard folder. Uh, some of this should be reviewed, um, possibly from your English 1101 courses or any other uh, literature or writing type courses prior to college. Uh, so just be mindful of these websites moving forward because they will be helpful when it comes to, uh, you know, discussion posts, uh, writing uh, essays and that type stuff. So let's, um, let me switch gears here and let's talk a little bit about week three, just to give you an overview. Uh, look at the assignment that's due this Sunday and then talk a little bit more about the fiction essay that's going to be due the following Sunday. So I'm going to share, I'm going to get another page coming up here momentarily. Um, so just bear with me. While I get everything sort of situated here. Okay, let's see if I can move this over would be helpful there. and share this screen. So as you can tell, we're at our Blackboard page, and I'm going to blow this up a little bit so you all can see it there without hopefully taking a lot of stuff off. Let's see. So the week three folder. Uh, as I said in a previous email, I went ahead and opened up week four. Uh, the reason why I did that, like I said in the email, is because the fiction essay is really a close reading of a particular passage uh, of one of the short stories that we've read basically from weeks one through four. So I wanted to give everybody enough stuff in case they didn't like what they read maybe in week one or two, they still had some options in week three or four. It has to be on one of the at this point, when we get through week four, to be eight short stories that we've read. So it has to be one of those stories. Um, the following week, which would be week five, is when you're going to have your fiction exam. And we talked a little bit about that last week. So if you had a chance to look at that 
information in the week two folder about the fiction exam and look at the uh, lecture tutoring video, I did talk a little bit more about how that was going to be set up and organized. So again, if you have any questions about that, let me know um, before week five gets, uh, because that will be coming up here in about two weeks. Uh, the, the exam will be a password sensitive driven exam, meaning b probably by the end of next week, I will give you the exam password uh, so you can get on it to take the exam. If you don't have the exam password, you're not going to be able to take the exam. So I'm, probably what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to send it out an email, but I'll also probably put the exam password uh, with the instructions and stuff on the test. So you can just use that same password. Uh, each exam that we do in here, though, is going to have a different password. So if you think that, you know, some students think, well, I can just use the same password for the poetry exam, the drama exam, they're going to be different. So um, the fiction exam password only works for the fiction exam password uh, for that particular test. So if you want to read ahead, uh, you can do so because again, the week four folder is open. Uh, we have Poe the Black Cat and Jackson's The Lottery. In case you want to possibly write on one of those two stories, you can. Uh, I'm giving you that option to read ahead. Plus, it gives you that more um, time to sort of study for the fiction exam as well. So, because really in week five, there's not that, there's probably maybe two more sh short stories that we're going to have to do, but the only big thing that you're going to have to do for week five is going to be the actual fiction exam. So, let's look, right? This week, you have reading in your uh, e text, literary conventions, writing about literature. Uh, pages 60 through 62, 72 through 76. Um, if you actually look, we're going to get a little bit involved with character and point of view, um, which basically these two short stories, The Hemingway's A Clean, Well-Lighted -lit Place and Manfield's Miss Brill, uh, deal a lot with point of view and character. So that will be, you know, related to the reading that we're going to do. But also the character and point of view are a big part of all the short stories uh, that we're basically reading for the, you know, for these five weeks of this unit. And then really what's due this week, we have a literary workshop and it's going to be a little bit different than the last two assignments that were due. Remember the first one was a quiz. Uh, the second one was a, um, a discussion post. This one is going to sort of alleviate maybe some of the stress. Um, you won't necessarily be quizzed or tested or have to write any, you know, discussion post over the, the two readings. But basically what you're going to have to do for this particular assignment is you're sort of being creative here. We're going to see, you know, you're going to use your creative juices to sort of create a dialogue or create a scene. And we'll look at uh, the actual prompt here momentarily. But it's not going to be... I guess as stressful as I got to read these multiple times to be able to, you know, answer a quiz question, or I got to take really good notes so I can do really well in the discussion post. This is going to be more of a creative exercise. Um, it should help maybe with the mindset. It should be really, you know, honestly, it should be one of those easy A's um, because it's not so it's not so much involved uh, with having to learn facts or remember a quotation or that type of stuff. So we will dive into that here momentarily. So do you have any questions about that right now, Megan, or anybody else that's online? I think you're, I think you're the only one. No. Okay. <clears throat> so again, if you click here, you click on these, it's going to take you to the individual stories. I do provide notes. That should be helpful. But again, anytime that you're reading these, I would suggest that you read the story first, look at the notes. If the notes, you know, in your first reading of the story are still a little bit confusing, you know, confusing or uh, you still wanting more. I mean, obviously, you can email me. You know, we could talk about it a little bit more uh, if you can find stuff online, um, you know, additional notes that will help 
with your reading, that that's fine. You just want to be careful that you're not overly using, you know, some of the places like Cliff Notes and Spark Notes because um, what students like to do, especially when they're pressed on time, is they like to use those as crutches and they would just read those and not necessarily take the time to go through and maybe read the story more than once and they think they understand what's going on when they really don't uh, because they're just basically getting sort of like a you know like it's a brief summary um, not to say that some of those are not bad to do or to have um, but you just don't want to read you know stuff from wikipedia or cliff notes or spark notes without you know really diving into the literature and giving it a chance because again a lot of these stories are relatively short um, it's not like you're having to read a, a 400 page novel each week. So with a lot of these, you can kind of read multiple times. Um, and you should get a good bit out of it because each week there's some sort of theme to it. Like this week is loneliness and experience. Um, you may be able to relate to some of these stories, um, which is you know, really good if you can. Uh, that, that helps the reading process uh, it may help when it comes to, you know, studying for a quiz or writing an essay or that type deal because you can relate to the story in some ways or the characters um, or the emotions involved. So <clears throat> here's the uh, Model A fiction essay, and we will talk about that here momentarily. Um, and it looks like I'm probably going to have to copy the actual essay um, prompt again and move it over. Hopefully everybody uh, printed that out or saved it from last week, but I will move that over. Uh, literary workshop. So basically what I want you to do here, and again, don't overthink this because it's not meant to be over, you know, overthought. It says write a dialogue between the beautifully dressed couple a dialogue that would confirm Mrs. Brill's view of herself and her own eyes, yet include the two waiters and the old man from Hemingway's fiction as well into the conversation. So really to be able to do this exercise, you're going to have to read what I'm talking about, the beautifully dressed couple, which is coming from Mansfield's Miss Brill. So you're definitely going to have to read that short story to be able to get the gist of what I'm talking about, because there is a beautiful dressed couple in that story. So once you read it and you kind of figure it out, that will make sense of that part. The other section of this comes from the Hemingway piece where <clears throat> there's a, it, it's basically set in a Spanish cafe and you have two waiters and you have this sort of this drunken old man who is refusing to leave. Uh, basically, because it's getting, you know, closing time, last call, so to speak. So you want to create a piece of fiction, a dialogue, if you will, that involves the beautifully dressed couple from Miss Brill, but also the two waiters and the old man um, from the Hemingway piece. So what you're doing, in a sense, is you're creating your own creative fiction here. Um, using dialogue not only from whoever character you want to have involved uh, in this particular setting which i say here the setting could be in the spanish cafe or you can sort of create your own setting here but you need to include you know the two waiters and the old man from the hemingway piece but, and also the beautifully dressed couple from um, the mansfield piece so you're creating your own little short story here uh, your only uh, your little short dialogue or passage between uh, your character um, and how the, how that character is relating to some of the other characters in the actual setting. Now, how long does this need to be? Well, really, it's up to you. I say anything from half a page to a page, right? As long as you know, I being your audience can read it and understand what you're trying to get across with your dialogue between not only your character that you're creating, but the other characters sort of scattered through. Um, if it makes sense, if it flows, if it maybe follows a little bit of a storyline from one of the two stories, 
or you can kind of come up with your own little um, plot line. As long as it makes sense, I can see a development. I can see that you obviously read the two stories because if you didn't read the two stories, you're not really going to know what I mean by the beautifully dressed couple and the two waiters and how they interact with the old man, that type stuff. So it should really be a nice, should be easy breezy, I hope, as it relates to um, writing this because basically you're just, you're creating the fiction here. Um, you're taking what you've learned from those two stories and you're adding your own character into a particular dialogue with some of these characters that you've met and read about in these two stories. Uh, just remember that each time that you have uh, a character with dialogue or speaking that you need to begin a new paragraph. And I think that might be the only hyperlink I didn't send out um, over the last two weeks. And I will send that out uh, later today because it sort of explains how to use dialogue when it comes to not only in your, you know, maybe in your essays, but also when you're writing like a creative piece. So this is a piece where you can have a little bit of fun. Um, it should show or should showcase some of your creative juices, your creative side, I hope, as it relates to fiction. Um, I'm not necessarily looking at, you know, right and wrong answers here because this is your this is your particular dialogue between your characters. This is your this is your baby, so to speak. I mean, you're creating the fiction here. I'm looking at does it make sense? Is it half a page to a page? Can I follow it? Does it have some sort of relation to one of the two stories from this week? Um, that type deal. So, <clears throat> I mean, obviously you want to sort of check your spelling and grammar, but as far as far as like quoting something per se from a story like you needed to do with the discussion post last week, you don't have to put any in, in text citations with this because you're making this story up. You're making this little dialogue uh, between these characters up. It's, Again, it's your baby, it's your creation. Um, so again, it should be very, I hope, an easy A for everybody. And, and the reason why I'm doing it this way in a lot of ways is to give your mind a bit of a break from the traditional quiz and discussion post. Because the following week, you're going to have to sort of get back in with your fiction essay, which we're going to talk about. And then we're going to finish off um, week five with the fiction test. So this is sort of that breathing room, right? If you need a little bit of a breathing room to catch up on the reading, uh, use week three to do that. If you need a bit of a breathing room to, you know, start with your rough draft for the fiction essay, do so because you can send me multiple drafts. Um, you can send smart thinking, hopefully it, it, it's working for everybody else. Uh, you can send them multiple drafts. Uh, you could start preparing and, and, you know, looking back at some of the, the previous six or eight short stories as it relates to the fiction exam coming up. So besides having something due, which is more or less a creative piece, there should be also be a chance that you can kind of reflect on the last two weeks and realize what, you know, the next two weeks have in store for you. So do you have any questions about that, Megan? No, sir. Okay. So <clears throat> have you have you read the, the two pieces for this week? No, sir, not yet. Okay. Uh, because I don't want to get too too much involved with that. What, you know, really it would be helpful if you know if you read it and then we can kind of discuss instead of me telling you. Um, because again, if I go over it, you're probably not going to understand or uh, really know what's going on because you didn't have a chance to experience it yourself. So that's that's the reason why I'm not going to go too involved with the stories because I'm pretty sure. I mean that that's fine because I'm sure the other cl your other classmates are probably in the same boat. Y'all just haven't had a chance to read them yet. Um, let me move that fiction. exam prompt so everybody i have it in case they didn't get it last week 
and I'll move this essay stuff. The exam and the essay. Let's see. So all this stuff will be back in your week three folder. No. In case you need the prompts or you need a additional information again about the uh, the fiction exam coming up so let me double check and make sure that's all there now should be yes so I'm just gonna move this back up so really with these instructions I guess let, let's look at the model A fiction exam or essay here. That's probably be a, a good place to start and it'll probably make the, the actual prompt make more sense too. Let me move this over. <clears throat> so when you download this fiction exam or essay, I do put uh, little guidelines, little hints, little pointers here in the margin, uh, which if you follow should make your essay a lot better too. Uh, if you notice, we're using the MLA format. Um, some of y'all that were doing the discussion post that uploaded a document, some of y'all did that right. Some of y'all didn't do it so, so right. Some of y'all are missing some stuff. Uh, so just remember, your name, first and last, my name, uh, the course, and I would put the date that the essay is actually due. That way you won't have to, you know, keep going back and changing the date. Plus, it's a little reminder of, hey, this thing is due on the 19th. So it's sort of there as a, a, a time guideline as well. Make sure that you have your last name and your page number on every page. So like here, Clement 1, Clement 2, Clement 3, Clement four, so on and so forth. Um, so the gist really of the actual prompt is of the eight stories, because by the time we get done with week four, we're going to have eight stories that we've already discussed, read and examined and that type stuff. You want to pick one of those stories that you really enjoy. Um, maybe one that you've read multiple times. That would probably be easier and helpful, especially if you, you know, annotated the text. You took your own notes uh, as you read the story. Maybe you printed it out and wrote in the margins yourself, which is always good. Um, but one of those eight stories, you want to pick a passage, a quotation. And I think originally uh, on the actual uh, uh, prompt, it says you need to have something like a short paragraph or anything from you know 10 to 20 lines. It has to be something that you can really um, dig into that you can really closely read and annotate and analyze so you can't really do just one sentence right it has to be something of a you know a short paragraph a short, short passage in this case this student did uh chopin's the story of an hour now we read chopin's uh desiree's baby so the story this particular story that this student did is a little different but the same premise is still the same. So what you're gonna have to do, you wanna give it sort of a creative title, right? Uh, like this student did here. You can't just call it fiction essay or close reading or paper one. Uh, you don't wanna have anything that doesn't have a title because it doesn't really reflect the writing that you're putting forth. So you wanna have a title. It doesn't necessarily have to be as lengthy as this one, but it needs to, have something that relates to your writing that is coming up. So just make sure that you have a creative title that reflects uh, what you're talking about in your essay. The next part, and this is where it's going to be really important, is you want to copy and paste 
that particular passage, that particular paragraph, that, that particular series of dialogue, whatever you're choosing from that particular story that you're going to be analyzing throughout, you want to have that right up front. Um, in between your first paragraph and your title of the essay. So this particular student, Jane, chose this passage uh, from the story of an hour. So this is actually a longer quotation. And basically what she did, because if you looked at some of those MLA uh, handouts that I send out, anytime that you quote more than four lines of a short story, you have to block it. And this is how you would block it. Basically, you're going to tab each one of these lines twice or space bar each line 10 spaces. So as you notice, there's no quotation marks at the beginning. There's no quotation marks at the end. You don't need to do that when you're blocking. Uh, you still need to do the parenthetical or in-text citation, basically where you're getting the information from. In this case, this comes from page 332 of Chopin's The Story of an Hour. Notice too, there's no period after your in-text citation when you're blocked. Here it comes at the very end of that particular passage or quotation. So, you know, I would probably, if you're sort of, well, I don't really know what, what to choose, then I would find a paragraph or a passage that's probably about this length. Right? So if you look, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. It's about six lines. I, I did say 10 to, you know, 10 to 20, but this one would be a good passage. Um, something that would give you enough to write, right? At least a thousand words. I think it's a thousand words or four pages. Now, this one is a, a little bit longer. Uh, don't feel like that yours needs to be as long as this particular model essay to get an A because um, if you keep it within the guidelines, you know, a thousand words, four pages, uh, you have a quote that you're analyzing throughout your essay and you have, you know, the four pages or a thousand words and you do everything else, you know, right as it relates to the grammar, the spelling, your analysis, then you should be okay. Um, because again, if you look at these margins, I sort of give you uh, guidelines about what the writer is doing well. Um, so use this essay sort of as a model, right? To look at the organization, the structure, the format of paragraphs. <clears throat> so if you notice too, and we're going to talk a little bit about this because I'm seeing this a lot in the discussion post. I highlight leaves here for a reason. And in my margin, I basically say that anytime that you're writing about literature, whether it's a novel, whether it's a short story, whether it's a novella, poetry, when we get uh, our next unit, week six, we're going to start talking about poetry, drama at the end. Anytime that you're analyzing or writing about literature, you always want to keep your verb tense in what they call historical or slash literary present tense. So your verb tense, for the most part, is going to be present tense. And the reason for that is characters of any type of fiction never die. Now, they may die in the story, but when we analyze them, they're still alive to us. Authors die, like Chopin, Shakespeare, Milton. They die because they're real-life people. We die. But these stories and their characters are going to live on way past us. So that's why you want to keep your verb tense in the historical literary present tense. Um, if you're referring to something in the past, like the 18th century in this case that, that this uh, Jane refers to, or if you refer to the author in some ways, those are usually items that you refer into the past because Chopin is, you know, long and dead and she is in the past, but her characters are still present to us. They're still living because they're part of fiction. Fiction always lives. Poetry always lives. Drama always lives, unless it's, you know, a, a piece of nonfiction. 
which we're not reading anything that's nonfiction in this course. So <clears throat> go back, you know, th and, and that's really sort of a, um, a reminder when we do another discussion post. Um, when we do another, you know, the poetry essay coming up later, uh, the research paper and all that stuff that you're double checking that your verb tense is in the present tense when you're talking about the literature. Um, do you have any questions with that? Maggie? No, sir. Okay. Um, because I did realize, and, I, and I'm teaching two sections of this, both online, and I, I I'm not sure if you had any problems with that per se, but I know there was some classmates in both classes that were, you know, referring to everything in the past tense. And they didn't need to do that when you're talking about something that's still living in a literary sense. Um, hopefully, whoever you had for 1101 sort of talked a little bit about that at the end when you were doing the research paper. Um, if not, this is, you know, a good chance for me to clarify that, to go ahead, and I hope to alleviate any other issues that students may have with that moving forward in the writing. The other thing is, because we're dealing with short fiction or short stories, uh, any anytime that you're dealing with a short story or short fiction, poetry is the same thing, song is the same way, uh, your title to that particular text is always going to be enclosed in quotation marks. You don't have to italicize a short story. You don't have to underline a short story. Some uh, students I've seen sort of were doing all three. They put quotation marks around it, they underlined it, and they italicized it. You just need to put quotation marks around the title. Uh, you don't have to do the underlining. You don't have to do the italicizing. So just use quotation marks. When we talk about poetry titles, the same thing, because poetry and song titles are basically one and the same in a lot of ways. Uh, you're going to put quotation marks around the title of your poem. Now, when we get into drama, because they're a longer work, they're like a novel, anything longer than a short story or a poem, like a novel or a film or a drama, you always italicize those titles. So just keep those in mind. Uh, the other thing is, as you can tell, I have Chopin 32 here, and then the author just basically has 32. So the deal there is, so you're not having to write the last name over and over and over again. If you mention the last name the first time that you do a quote, any time after that, you just need to use the page number. Uh, because if you look, I go from Chopin to 32. If we scroll down, it's just sort of the same way. We have one. We have 331. So you don't need to mention the last name unless you're using um, multiple, you know, multiple versions of that same story. Uh, chances are, if you're just using the ones that I've uh, did the hyperlink for, you're just going to be using that version unless you're looking at a different one. Then you might want to clarify the version that you're using. And you could probably do so, you know, easily with the Works Cited page as well. The thing that you have to kind of keep in mind, as I have here, um, this is sort of, you know, your introduction paragraph. Every time that you start a new paragraph, you want to indent. One, you know, one tab, five spaces. Uh, make sure that at the end of your introduction paragraph, this one is a little bit lengthy, but it's fine with this particular uh, paper, that your very last sentence of that introduction paragraph is your thesis statement. It's basically going to be the fuel that drives your entire paper, basically your main idea. So in this case, and it's usually one sentence in, in length. So if you find that your thesis statement is going to, you know, two, three sentences or becoming, you know, more like a thesis paragraph, you need to go back and sort of weed out all the extra stuff that you don't need to make it one clear, concise um, main idea sentence. 
like this, uh, like Jane did here. It says, despite the criticism, Chopin has created an amazing work of literature in the story of an hour by using literary devices such as setting, symbolism, and tone and style to build a beautifully composed short story. So again, she's using this main quotation that shows a lot about the setting, the symbolism, the tone and style. So of course, you may have to quote other areas in your particular story to make your claims, to make your points, what you want to do. But the main, main passage that you're sort of basing your essay on is the one that you originally had in between your title and your first uh, paragraph, which is your introduction here. Afterwards, just make sure that each one of your body paragraphs, your first sentence has a topic sentence. Now, a lot of this is sort of a review from 1101, but some students still kind of have an issue with topic sentences. And basically what the topic sentence of each one of your body paragraphs is gonna do for you or do or help the reader is you're explaining that particular topic throughout that paragraph. So usually it's one idea per paragraph would make it you know easier for not only you as the writer, uh, but also me as the, the reader, um, the editor, the proofreader, the grader, so on and so forth. Because again, you're gonna wanna probably send me drafts of this, um, especially if this is sort of the first time that you've ever you know, did a close reading of a particular passage of a story or, you know, in general, I always welcome rough drafts of anything because I believe that they truly do help the grade at the end. Um, so just make sure that that first sentence of your body paragraphs is your topic sentence. And then every other sentence, pretty much from the second one up to that concluding sentence, deals with that main idea in a particular paragraph. You don't want to try to cram too many ideas uh, in your topic sentence because it's just that one, it's going to make your paragraph really lengthy, which you probably don't really need to have, you know, a paragraph that goes three or four pages. I've seen that happen before in the past where they just cram so much in that first topic sentence. And then they have a um, body paragraph that goes nearly the length of the paper needs to without any paragraph breaks. That's why I sent out that, um, hand out about paragraph breaks when they, to make them logically, when they make sense, that type deal, because you don't want to have four pages with just one paragraph. Um, that's not going to do too well for your grade because it's just, it's a bunch of stuff jumbled together. You don't have any breaks. Uh, we don't see any logical transitions from one point to the next. So that's the, the other reason to look at this particular model essay, because this student did make an A on this type of paper. They do use uh, paragraph breaks in logical, meaningful ways. Here again, we have another quote from the actual story that really supports what this uh, particular student is trying to get across in this first uh, body paragraph. Notice, and this is the other thing that we need to talk a little bit about, because I did send out that handout about how to quote um, pr short prose or you know fiction writing. Anytime that you have sort of like a verb here, like this student has here, but, it, but where it says Chopin portrays this by stating, if you have a verb says, um, expresses, explains, and you have a quote that comes after that verb, you generally want to have a comma between. Um, that verb and when you start that quotation. If you end, uh, if you lead into your quotation not having a verb, then you need to use a colon, not a semicolon. Um, because that's the rules that the MLA basically have set out. As you notice here, this particular writer puts brackets around this name Richard. It's because they want to clarify who is the character they're talking about. If you have a, you know, a story that has a lot of different male characters like this one does, 
the student pretty much put Richard in the brackets to make it clear to your reader who they uh, are referring to. Uh, ellipsis, be careful with that. I've been seeing some folks, they like to use the ellipsis at the beginning of a sentence and you don't really need to do that or a beginning of the quote. Usually you want to use ellipsis uh, in the middle of your particular quotation. Uh, you don't necessarily want to use them at the end or the beginning. So, and the deal with the ellipsis is that you're just eliminating parts of that quote that you don't feel like it's going to be very important for the reader to know. And whatever that you eliminate, you want to make sure that the quote still makes sense. Like here, if this particular writer got rid of he, uh, if you read the sentence with, you know, just had only taken, it wouldn't make sense. So you want to make sure that whatever you're uh, eliminating from your particular quotation, if you need to eliminate anything, that it still makes sense to not only that particular quotation, but overall the context, the meaning of your particular passage or your sentence or whatever that you're trying to do. Usually your last sentence of each one of your body paragraphs is going to be a concluding sentence, but it's also going to be a way that you transition smoothly, we hope, to your next body paragraph or your next point. Uh, Ultimately, you want to make sure that your paragraphs, in a lot of ways, refer back to what you're initially trying to prove um, from your thesis statement. So you don't want to include anything that's not really a part of your, your main idea that you're trying to get across. Um, don't add extra stuff, right? You want to sort of, your thesis statement also is going to be your blueprint. It's sort of like your map. Um, for the rest of the essay. It helps your reader take that journey with you as you are writing from one paragraph to the next. I'm trying to think if there's anything here. Again, we talk about page numbers. Here we lower the deal with the bracket around this uh, K in this case. If this is basically telling me that originally this quote the K was capitalized uh, in that particular part of the story. But if you look, I'm basically, this student is blending this. The opening line of the story is they're blending their quotation in the, in with the rest of their actual sentence. So you don't want to have a capital letter um, at, you know, in the middle of your sentence. So to make that change, and to allow that your audience know that you're making that change, you want to put a bracket around that letter. Um, you can sort of do that with verb tense. If you need to change the verb tense of a quote, let's say you're going from past to present, then you can put the bracket around uh, the part that you're making the change on. Uh, you can do that with certain spellings, that type deal. Hopefully, I mean, if you're unsure about how to do the bracketing or need to know, hey, am I doing it right, that type deal, if you send me drafts, I will let you know if you need a bracket or not. Here again, states, right? It's a verb. We have a comma. Um, here we just we're blending the quote in with the rest of our sentence, which is good. I'm trying to find one that maybe has a colon. Again, stating. We have a comma. I don't know if this particular student studying again uses a colon. Writes another a comma, says a comma, says a comma. So they're using a, a good bit of these verbs or they're actually blending the quote in with the rest of the sentence, which that's fine. Um, But basically, you know, if you end, and maybe I'll pull that up to show you, because this person's just using a, a lot of these uh, these verbs and stuff, which that's fine. Uh, always notice that you need to have a works cited page. The works cited page is going to be the very last page of your paper. So if you have a four-page paper, uh, your fifth page is where your works cited page is going to be. Like in this case, the very last page of Jane's paper is on page five. So you want to go to your next 
available page, which would be page six in her case, to create the works cited page. You need to have this centered. It needs to say works cited. In your case, this person used a couple extra sources. You don't have to go out and do research unless you just want to do the extra research. If that will help you, you know, get the three or four pages that you need. Um, what I suggest that if you're going to do the research, that you get reputable sources. Like you go through Galileo, you go through the databases that the library here provides for you. Um, be wary about getting stuff off the uh, Google and that type of stuff, unless they're, you know, they're coming from like a .edu or .org or .gov website, because a lot of the .coms, right, CliffNote.com, Wikipedia.com. Um, they may not be necessarily scholarly in nature and really reputable to what you need. Um, so if you're just doing a traditional close reading, which is that's what you're doing of that particular passage that you chose from one of your stories, you should only really have one entry in your work site. So in this case, instead of being works and the reason why we have works here is because you're using more than just one work in your case it would just be work cited and let's just say that this person didn't use these extra sources it's be the work that you're actually analyzing um just note that if you do use quotations from other sources like this person does like right here that whatever you quote or whatever you cite in the body of your paper, you must have a works cited entry for it. Um, I see a lot of folks that they will say, well, I've read, you know, I've read five or six sources, but they never use any of the quotations or nothing in the body of the paper, but they still want to list five or six sources here. Well, you didn't use it. You just read it. You didn't, you know, unless you plagiarized it somehow, which that's also a big red flag. Um, Whatever is in on this particular page, I should be able to see an in-text citation that relates back to it and vice versa. So whatever I see here cited, I should be able to go to your works cited page and say, oh, okay, they got it from, you know, the short story, the story of the hour. Um, so that's the deal with the works cited page. Because a lot of folks will just like to throw up a bunch of stuff there. And half the time they never cite, or if they do cite it, they do it incorrectly. So you want to just be careful with that. Um, because when you turn this final essay in, it's going to go through a plagiarism uh, checker. And you don't want to have half your paper flagged uh, for copying and pasting from a website, or half the paper flagged because you didn't know how to properly do the in-text citation correctly. And to deal with the college, they, they look at plagiarism in a couple of different ways. They look at it as, you know, it doesn't really matter whether you in, intentionally did it or didn't know because you've heard the term plagiarism. It's in your syllabus. We talked about it. You learned about it in 1101 or you should have. Um, they don't look at it as, well, I just didn't know the policy states if you get caught with it, you get a zero the first time. So, and we know what zeros do um, to grades. They basically drop you down about 20 points, uh, which is not a good feeling to have. So just be careful of that. Again, send drafts. That's usually the key um, because this is going to be due, right? Today's the seventh. So it's not this Sunday, but next Sunday. So you basically got the rest of this week, all week four, and you know, that's it. So I would definitely, you know, start sending drafts as soon as as soon as you can. The more drafts, the better usually. Uh, I will probably have to cut off the draft time. Um, you know, probably because it's gonna be due by eleven fifty nine on on the 19th, you know, by midnight of Saturday, September 18th. If you're going to send drafts, I need it by that time because otherwise, um, I can't guarantee that if you did send something on the 19th, if I have enough time because it is a Sunday after all, um, 
to to go through it, especially if I have a lot of folks, and that's usually what happens. I have a lot of folks that wait until you know 12 hours before it's due, and they start slamming me with a bunch of uh, files. Hey, can you proofread? Can you look at this? Which you know I don't mind doing, but it would have been nice if you would have sent something, you know, maybe on the 13th or the 14th, because now you have enough time to go back and digest and really correct and. Uh, because I'm not going to, that's why I, I suggest multiple drafts, because I'm not going to catch everything, neither is smart thinking. We're not going to catch everything that first read through. Um, just like when you read that short story, you're not going to catch every single detail of that story. That's why you want to give yourself enough time, especially with stuff that's really short, like the stories I've been giving, uh, to read them multiple times to be able to see not only the major details, but some of the minor details. Uh, and, that, and that's really what builds not only good critical and analytical thinking, but it will also build really good critical and analytical writing. Uh, that's why I say as many drafts as you think you need. Um, if you already are a pretty established and decent writer, meaning you did really well in 1101, uh, you did well in a lot of your literature-based high school classes. You may not have to do as many drafts, especially if you're sending me one and smart thinking one basically at the same time. You may have to do, you know, three or four. Uh, for those that, you know, literature and analyzing and writing essays are just not your thing, you may have to do six, seven, or eight, depending on what, you know, what your grade, where you want your grade to be. Um, some folks want to strive for the A. Kudos to them. Um, but just know that your first draft is not going to give you the A. It's not going to give you the B, probably. Um, at best, it may give you sort of a, you know, in the C range. But most of them are probably going to be below that. And you're going to want me to mark the heck out of them. You'd rather me mark, mark them now ahead of time because you're going to have enough time to go back to use your time wisely to correct the things that you need to correct to really improve the grade. Um, yes, it's time consuming. Yes, it can be a bit boring and a bit challenging. But really, I mean, that's where you get good writing skills. It's, uh, it, it's sort of like doing math. Um, you got to practice that, you know, you got to go through practice problems to do really well on the test. Well, with essay writing, you got to write multiple drafts to do well on the essay. It's just the way, you know, it's just the way of the world when it comes to writing essays. There's not too many people that I know that can, you know, write an A quality essay the first time around. I can't. I have to go through multiple drafts. Um, most of our successful writers had to go through multiple drafts to write these stories. They didn't write a great story the first time around either. Uh, Shakespeare, he has multiple drafts of his plays. He didn't write Hamlet the first time around and it became a masterpiece. Um, very few people have that quality. <clears throat> I think there's only two, um, two literary figures that I know that have that genius to be able to do that. And then one was a blind, basically became blind. He was John Milton. You might have probably heard of him with, uh, he wrote his epic Paradise Lost. He basically did that blind. Um, and he had the help of his daughters basically be his eyes. He gave them the information and they basically wrote it down. Uh, another one was really big about procrastination and waiting until, you know, two hours before a deadline was Samuel Johnson. Um, they just had that ability to work under pressure really well. I, you know, not too many people can do that and not too many writers can, you know, bang out, um, their first draft as their masterpiece. So that's why I say, please send the drafts. I welcome the drafts. Um, you're going to find out depending on how far you go up in your college career that some folks don't deal with drafts so much. I think that's sort of a, uh, it's, it's a disservice to the student uh, because you need to know what you're doing right and you need to know what you're doing wrong before you get graded, I believe. Um, I mean, I would want somebody to point out, hey, you know, if you did this, this would make it better, you know, especially before I got graded. I mean, it, you're sort of giving yourself the chance to 
uh, screw up early on so you can make something out of out of your mistakes to get a, a really good grade. And you have time. I mean, um, even though this thing is due on the 19th, you've had since last week, really, because you had the topic. So it's not like I just threw this stuff out and said, hey, you have a four-page essay in two days. You had nearly three or four weeks to do it. So you had nearly three or four weeks to send me drafts, too, if you take advantage. Now, again, that's optional. If you feel like what you're doing uh, will give you the grade that you're, you know, yearning for, then by all means, do what you're doing. But I've been teaching this a long time now, and I can pretty much – say for fact that usually that first draft and when students turn the first draft in as their final draft, you can kind of tell because it's just riddled with surface stuff. I mean, it's just riddled with errors that you should have learned from 1101, like spelling, um, various comma errors. It's, it just looks like it's rushed. Um, and we can tell that before we even really start, you know, getting to page two. We know by that first page, if this person really took some time and really thought about what they were trying to put on paper. Um, because it's it's very obvious w when you look at a draft that is somebody's first draft, you know, and they're turning it in as their final draft. When you look at somebody's final draft that had at least three or four revisions, um, it, it difference between night and day. And that's usually the difference between the A and the B, or the B and the C, that type deal. Um, I know our time is starting to run out. Do we have any questions as it relates to what we need to do for the literary workshop for week three assignment this Sunday, or for the um, fiction essay that is going to be due on the 19th? Um, I'm still kind of iffy about my paper, but, uh, like, one of the main questions I have is, like, the last, like, paragraph or paragraphs, however many, like, one chooses to make it, uh, section F, I think, is the last one. Okay. I'm just a bit confused about that part. I think that's, like, the main part that I'm, like, confused about. All right, let me see. Let me pull that up. Okay, where it says putting it all together? Yes, sir. So you're just sort of coming, I mean, you're just uh, putting everything together as it relates to, it says you don't necessarily have to uh, summarize what you've already presented. Uh, but what you're trying to do in that case is, you know, do you have any other open, like open-ended questions? Is there any other questions that you would like to ask of the text that maybe you didn't have a chance to, or maybe, you know, that your reader or your audience would have some type of questions that they would ask of your work, like if you didn't get a chance, because really what this is doing is, you're analyzing a close pa or doing a close reading on a passage. Um, you're looking at what it says here. Is there any trends that you have discovered throughout that passage? Like, do you see any difference of the writing style of the author uh, as you move through some of that particular passage or that story? Um, as you really closely read that passage is there anything new that really comes out now like is there that eureka or that aha moment that just there's a light bulb that goes off um from you know because you're you're basically going through a journey you're taking us through a journey and you're giving us sort of your interpretation of that passage and that type stuff um, is there anything you know maybe now looking you know reflecting back on that writing that hey I'm finding a couple of new things now. I know I'm not going to have time to do it, but maybe, you know, point, 
your audience in that direction. Hey, I found this really interesting on the passage. Maybe if somebody really analyzed this a little bit more, they, they could find something additional uh, of what that particular um, author is trying to do there. And it says also, you know, what questions could you ask about the passage that, that the reader would answer in unusual ways? So in a lot of ways, your la that letter F is more of a like a speculative paragraph. You're just sort of challenging your reader a little bit more. You might be challenging yourself without really you know, answering your own questions. You're sort of just leaving them out there for your audience to sort of decide or answer for you. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. And, and keep in mind, too, because I think I put up here early on, that you don't have to establish all of these. Right? It says complete bolded section A through F. Um, but keep in mind, you may not need to, you know, do all A through F. You may want to do, like, maybe A, B, and C. Or you can do B, C, and D. You don't have to do everything. This is just sort of a outline to go by. I mean, obviously, you want to probably do a couple of the, you know, th at least three of these letters. But don't feel like you have to do A through F. Because that would really make your paper probably fairly long if you try to tackle everything. Well, see, I guess that might be where I kind of messed up because my paper is like five pages long, but I did like A through F. I just didn't do like every little bullet point under A through F. Like I, I established like. Yeah, because it says here, it says, do not feel like you must address every single bullet point in every bold section. So if you do like if you did a couple in A, a couple in B, a couple in C, that would work. Yes, sir. Because I think that 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 could be the issue too. Everybody's gonna look at A and like, man, I have to do all of these. No, just do one or two, and then move on. One or two in B, one and two in C. As long as it makes sense and it flows. I mean, you're still tackling A through F. You're just not having to do all these bullet points under A and F. So that's where you want to be sort of selective. That's why I give you some stuff to look at. I give you some questions maybe that you can kind of answer on certain ones. But don't feel like you have to do all of these bullet points. You don't. Yes, sir. But again, I mean, once, I, once I'm able to read what you have, I can probably, you know, say, well, this is good. Keep going with this, or maybe you shouldn't, you know, maybe you shouldn't involve yourself too much with this particular bullet point. And, and you know what? You may be doing um, a lot better than what you think you're doing. I mean, if you got five pages, I probably wouldn't add any more at, at this point until, you know, somebody has a chance to look at it. Yes, sir. That would be my advice, because otherwise, I mean, you can write yourself into, um, you could probably go on and on if you really wanted to. We're not trying to make this, you know, more, we're not trying to make this more than what it is, meaning we're not trying to get research paper length here, because you're not having to use any research. Um, so if you keep it, you know, a thousand words for, I mean, what you have, five pages, that, I mean, that's, that's fair. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to do any more right now until I have a chance or smart thinking or somebody has a chance to really look at it. And you're probably way ahead of the game because you're the only one that I know that has started and has five pages. Yes, sir, I was just trying to get it done like over the weekend and everything because like during the week I have, I'm taking four classes right now. So like during the week I have other classes to do. And then these next few weekends I'm gonna be out of town so I wouldn't have time to do it. So I just wanted to go ahead and do it and get it done. So that way all I had to do was just like revise what I already had. Yeah, and that makes sense. Um, especially since we had a little bit of a, uh, a longer weekend, we won't have another longer weekend sort of like that until Thanksgiving break. So 
And I do understand about getting ahead, especially when you're going out of town and you got other classes, which that, you know, that's good because really at this point, it's just going to be back and forth probably with the drafting process, which should be less, less of a stressor than it will be, you know, if you're having to write this thing out for fresh, like a lot of folks are probably going to take this week or next week to do. You're, you already did your writing. Now it's just modifying and, and fixing what needs to be fixed. <coughs> yes, sir. So as it gets closer to the 19th, you probably won't be freaking out as much as folks that, you know, if they waited until this weekend to really start, uh, because now they only have what, seven days or whatever it would be if they waited into Saturday or Sunday um, to get started. So what you did is is very wise and it's smart because again the drafting process even though it can be a drag and it can be a pain it's not like you know what you have there i'm sure you're not going to have to go through and tear up all five pages and start over because you probably have something down there um, of substance we just need to see what it is so we can modify the stuff that needs to be modified and you know if you sent me a draft a day, you could be looking at, depending on how much stuff needs to be modified, it may not be a whole lot either. You can turn it in earlier because the Dropbox is going to be up. It's already up in the week four folder. You don't necessarily have to wait till the 19th if we go through a series of rough drafts and you feel like, hey, I'm, I'm pretty good to go. I, I think the writing is substantial. I'm tired of looking at the darn thing. I just want to submit it and, and be done with it. Then, you know, you could turn it in on the 15th if you wanted to. Uh, you don't necessarily have to wait until the 19th, is basically what I'm saying. If you just want to sort of get it out of your hair. I mean, obviously, I would, you know, take advantage of the time to send me drafts um, so we can make whatever is there better to get the best possible grade. But as far as the, the heavy lifting and stuff, when everybody's going to be sort of freaking out, you know, during next week, you're going to be done with that part. Yes, sir. And then you can concentrate on whatever you need to concentrate on in other classes because you're pretty much done with what you need to do for next week's stuff, which makes sense. All right, is there any other questions or concerns or issues at this point before we sort of call it a day? No, sir, I'm good. Okay, well, just let me know. You can email me pretty much any time. I try to get back uh, with folks. I know over, uh, um, over the weekend, I had some internet issues. I don't know if anybody uses Comcast or Xfinity, but it seems like on the weekends, they like to uh, screw around with the internet. So my internet was sort of up and down. Um, and I apologize for that because some folks were sending me drafts in other classes and stuff. And it was just, I want to help, but I can't help if I don't have internet. So. Yes, sir. I used to have Comcast and we always had, like it always went out all the time. but. We moved and where I moved to, they don't offer Comcast out in this area. So we have a different Wi-Fi now and it seems to be good so far. Yeah, that's good because I don't, yeah, I don't know. We've always used Comcast and they've been pretty good up until those, you know, really up until the, the time we started with this pandemic stuff. I don't know if it's just because everybody's online learning with some of the public schools or what, but it just... It's like it'll work fairly well during the week or when you're not home, it works. But of course, when you have pressing things and you want to do stuff is when it wants to, you know, act up on you. So it's just frustrating. Yes, sir. All righty. Well, unless uh, if that's it, we can kind of call it a, uh, a session for today. Just like I said, send me drafts, send me questions. Um, let me know if there's anything. And like I said, I try to... Uh, help you out with that um, smart thinking thing too. I, I will send you Heather's information here momentarily uh, to see if she can just, I, you know, I would try to explain to her what you just explained to me about smart thinking and see what kind of suggestions she has. Maybe she can 
give you a number or something, you can kind of get in touch with them and see what's going on. Yes, sir. And until, I guess, uh, next week, have a great week. You too. Thanks.